Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. Let's get straight to the docket. First, George Kelly won. The DA rejects Brian Koberger's alibi notice. Suzanne Morphew. So is the guy whose DNA was in her bike helmet, in her car, and on her bike now a suspect? Donald Trump was held in contempt. The Karen Reed trial continues, although very short today. And did they call central casting for the witnesses with those Boston accents? And our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. 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 Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below about what we discuss and hit that little bell for notifications. And remember, you can catch us on any of your favorite podcasting apps anytime as well. Okay, before we get to the show, a couple of quick reminders. First, it's Tuesday, so that means we're going live 6 p.m. Mountain Time And we'll be here for about an hour or so, or maybe a little longer. And then we'll go straight into our Patreon show for our Patreon members for their private show as well. So if you haven't become a Patreon member, now is the time to do so. And we will be discussing, obviously, the Brian Koberger matter, the Suzanne Morphew recent developments, and anything you would like to talk about that you ask in the chats. We'll do our best to get to all of your questions and hopefully provide a satisfactory answer for you. All right, so let's go ahead and open the record for April 30th, 2024. And first on the docket, that's right, George Kelly won. The district attorney has stated that they will not retry George Kelly. Now, as you may recall, George Kelly was the Arizona rancher charged with murder in the shooting of a Mexican national on his uh, property that is up along the border. Now, remember, Mr. Kelly's 75 years old, and the state charged him with second-degree murder after he allegedly shot and killed the uh, Mexican national, a guy by the name of Gabriel Quinbutmea, on uh, Mr. Kelly's land in January of 2023. Now, the decision not to retry Mr. Kelly comes a week after a mistrial was declared after the jury stated that they were deadlocked. And let's be clear, they were deadlocked 7-1 to one for not guilty. So the prosecution could not ignore that fact. Clearly, there was one lone juror out there that wasn't going to change their mind, look at the evidence objectively, apparently, and they stuck to their guns. Either way, George Kelly wins. So the uh, the defense attorneys did, in fact, confirm that there was one lone holdout juror who wanted to convict while all the other sought to acquit Mr. Kelly. Now, the case centered around, like I said, the death of the Mexican uh, national who was found on Kelly's uh, property, which is about a 170-acre cattle ranch near Kino Springs, which is just outside of Nogales, Arizona back in January of 2023. Now, the Mexican national had illegally entered the country multiple times previously and had been deported as recently as 2016. Now, Kelly's defense countered the uh, prosecution's argument that the Mexican national was an unarmed migrant and had suggested that cartel's influence tainted the death investigation. Now, during the trial, the uh, prosecutor said that Mr. Kelly recklessly fired nine shots from an AK-47 rifle toward a group of men, including the Mexican national, which was about 100 yards away from the property. Kelly said he did fire warning shots in the air, but claimed that he did not shoot at anyone directly. The defense maintained Kelly only fired warning shots into the air from his patio earlier in the day, and his wife, Wanda Kelly, testified about dialing their Border Patrol ranch liaison upon spotting the two armed men dressed in camouflage and carrying rifles and backpacks walking about 100 feet from their home. Well, the fatal bullet was never recovered from the scene, and um, that is how the case basically went down. Now, originally, it was kind of a self-defense case. I thought there was trouble with self-defense given the distance away from Mr. Kelly and his wife, and you really can't protect personal property, real estate, with um, deadly force. So what became obviously clear was the fact that the uh, seven of the eight jurors 
did not believe that the prosecution had proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Kelly was, in fact, the shooter. So that is, in fact, um, significant. The system works. And uh, it's unfortunate, though, that Mr. Kelly had to go through that. Um, let's just say I hope from personal experience uh, that uh, if he owes his attorney money, that he pays her every penny of it and doesn't take the position, well, it was obvious that I was guilty, you prepared too much. Something along those lines. Pay your attorney, Mr. Kelly. I'm sure you did. Not saying you didn't. Just, just do it. Next, the prosecution believes that the alibi notice in the Brian Koberger case is completely incomplete and devoid of what is required under the statute. So like we always like to do here, make sure you get it all. So what do I have in my hot little hands here? That's right, the actual motion. So we'll cut to the chase on this though, because they go through all the perfunctory beginnings and they incorporate various motions to compel notice of defense alibi. And the state states as follows, the state respectfully submits the defendants Supplemental alibi response continues to lack the specificity required by Idaho Code Section 19-519, which provides that the defense shall state the specific place or places at which the defendant claims to have been at the time of the alleged offense and the names and addresses of the witness upon whom he intends to rely to establish such alibi. Now, the defendant's April 17th, 2024 submission minimally adds to the alibi notice dated July 24th of 2023. And the defendant states that he was driving around during the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, and drove through the area of South Pullman, Washington, west of Moscow, Idaho, including the Huawei Park with the exception of the reference of the Huawei Park, which is new, the defendant is offering nothing new to his initial alibi that he simply was driving around during the morning hours of November 13th of 2022. As the state noted during the August 2023 20, hearing, the state is aware that the defendant was driving around rural areas in Whitman County, Washington, and Leta County, Idaho during the early morning hours of November 20. November 13th of 2022. In fact, the defendant travels during that time are described in the original probable cause affidavit supporting the criminal complaint in this case. As the defendant's reference to potential testimony about the location of the defendant's cell phone on the morning of November 13th, 2022, this information does not rise to the level of an alibi at the time of the homicides because the defendant's cell phone stopped reporting to the cellular network before the homicides and continue to not report until after the homicides. The location of defendant's cell phone at times other than the time of the homicide is not proof of or relevant to the defendant's specific location at the time of the homicides, approximately 4 to 4.30 a.m. in the morning hours of November 13th of 2022. It is the state's position that the defendant's continued failure to adequately comply with the Idaho Code 195191 does not trigger a response under Idaho code regarding 1915 195192 if the court deems the defendant's supplemental response to be in compliance with the requirements of the Idaho code the state requests additional time pursuant to the code to prepare a list of witnesses to establish the defendant's presence at the scene of the homicides. As to witnesses to rebut a claim of alibi, the defendant's failure to adequately comply with the Idaho Code means the state does not know what specific assertions it needs to rebut. If the court allows the defense to offer witnesses or information regarding alibi, which the state opposes, and brings it into compliance with the code, the state will then respond accordingly. It has now been approximately 11 months since the state filed its request for discovery, disclosure, alibi, demand on May 23rd of 2023, and almost a year and a half since the homicides occurred. The defendant has been given more time than he is legally entitled in order to provide an as alibi. The state is substantially prejudiced and compromised in its ability to investigate and respond to new or additional alibi-related disclosures. And as the uh, Idaho Court of Appeals noted in uh, State v. Juarez, the state has a legitimate interest in obtaining timely and complete discovery responses from the defendant. The state respectfully submits that we were essentially remain in the same position 
as in July and August of 2023, and that, like in the Juarez case, we don't know how this is an alibi at all. As the state further noted in the July 27, 2023 motion to compel notice of defense alibi or alternatively to bar certain evidence, the United States Supreme Court has observed in Taylor v. Illinois the ease with which an alibi can be fabricated. And the state's interest in protecting itself against an 11th hour defense is both obvious and legitimate. Based on the above, the state respectfully requests the court to enter an order denying the defendant any further opportunity to add any purported claim of alibi and preclude testimony by anyone other than the defendant as to the defendant's absence from or presence at the scene of the homicide. So that's the motion itself. So let's take a quick look at the statute as well. This is Idaho uh, Code uh, Section 19-519, Notice of Alibi at any time after arraignment before a magistrate upon a complaint upon written demand of the prosecuting attorney, the defendant shall serve within 10 days or at such different time as the court may direct upon the prosecution attorney a written notice of his intention to offer a defense of alibi. Such notice by the defendant shall state the specific place or places at which the defendant claims to have been at the time of the alleged offense and the names and addresses of the witnesses upon whom he intends to rely upon to establish the alibi. Now, that's pretty standard alibi instructional um, requirement. If you're going to have somebody else other than the defendant testify as to where he was, you have to give notice. Where I normally practice here in the great state of Colorado, it's um, 35 days prior to trial, which is more than sufficient time. I cannot believe that Idaho does it so early, but I get it. Hey, if you got an alibi and it's going to check out, let's not waste anybody's time. Let's get this case resolved if that's not you, right? Paragraph two of this statute then says that within 10 days after receipt of the defendant's notice of alibi, but in no event less than 10 days before trial, unless the court otherwise directs, the prosecuting attorney shall serve upon the defendant or his attorney a written notice stating the names and addresses of the witnesses upon whom the prosecution intends to rely upon to establish the defendant's presence at the scene of the alleged offense and any other witnesses to be relied upon to rebut the testimony of the defendant's alibi witnesses. Now, in all honesty, I don't think that'd be very tough. It was gonna to be all of the cell phone people crime scene investigators, DNA people. It's basically their case in chief. Not really sure why that's required, but okay. Then the next paragraph, if prior to or during a trial, a party learns of additional witnesses who identify, if known, should have been included in the information furnished under subsection one or subsection two of this section, the party shall promptly notify the other party or his attorney of the existence and identity of such additional witnesses. Okay, seems to make sense. Upon the failure of either party to comply with the requirements of this section, the court may exclude the testimony of an undisclosed witness offered by such party as to the defendant's absence from the presence at the scene of the alleged defense. This section shall not limit the right of the defendant to testify in his own behalf. The defendant can always testify, and frankly, you don't have to give notice of that. Anyway, for good cause shown, the court may grant an exception to any of the requirements of subsection one through section four of this section. Okay, so the judge can basically say we're gonna bend the rules a little bit. Obviously, it's a huge case, but as the prosecution states, Brian Koberg and his defense team have had a year and a half to kind of work on this. You think you would be able to do that if it's an alibi. I think the prosecution, I get it. They're trying to hold their feet to the fire to the defense. I would simply say, if I was the prosecutor, okay, that's the best you got. All right, judge, uh, give us a deadline so that we can have all the reports of their expert. We'd like to see his report as quickly as possible so that we can comply uh, with our obligations under this particular section as well. And if the best they have, I mean, I get it, the prosecution, they, that's not an alibi, that's not an alibi. Okay but they're already forcing the hand of the defense to say, I'm gonna bring in the cell phone expert who's gonna say that Brian Kober was out driving around. I get it, that's good for the prosecution. That's good for the prosecution because you can say that's not a 
alibi defense. An alibi is you were there specifically at the time of the homicide. And it's good for the prosecution if the defense can't say at this very exact moment, anywhere on uh, November 13th in the early morning hours between 4 and 4.30, you can't provide a specific location, not an alibi defense. And you jump up and down on that all the way through trial. I get they're trying to, to, to do this, but you really think you're going to prohibit uh, that information coming in? No. Guess what? Because even if that witness were excluded, the expert, which he probably won't, will not be, don't you think that expert is basically going to write the cross-examination for the government's expert witnesses? Of course they are. So all the stuff that he's out driving around during this particular time, you don't really know, but we think we may have some other information through radio frequency waves or something along those lines. It's coming in anyway. So Mr. Prosecutor, you're getting what you want. I get it. You file the motion. Maybe the judge say, says, hey, Mr. Koberger, defense team, you need to be specific. You, you know the time frame when the murder allegedly took place. Tell us where he was during that time period. And if, it's, if you don't have the alibi other than the defendant, so be it. Prosecution gets what they want. You've flushed out information from the defense. That's the way it's supposed to work. And if the defense doesn't have a valid alibi, then that's the way the system works. This is what people oftentimes forget. There's a lot of legal maneuvering that goes on in a case. And in our adversarial system, which is probably the best in the world, proposition put forward, the other side tests that proposition, and you see if it holds its weight, so to speak, um, or whether it uh, falls and crumbles, uh, because that's the way it's supposed to do things. The truth comes out when people challenge and are given the opportunity to challenge certain things that people allege. The truth is coming out. Whether it's at a hearing shortly after trial, the truth is coming out. So whether it's shortly after a hearing for say an arraignment, or it's after a trial, the truth or a pretty close version of that truth is going to come out, ladies and gentlemen. So be patient, all right? If you believe Brian Koberger is uh, guilty or you believe the evidence is tending to lean that way, we'll give him the presumption of innocence. Then you simply have to say, it's not a valid alibi. Uh, they shouldn't be allowed to uh, bring in their uh, witness to testify to an alibi during the time of the offense. And frankly, where he was all the other times may be completely irrelevant, the judge may conclude. If you're saying, no, Brian Koberger is innocent, you should say, hey, now's the time. Put, her, put up um, your information that you have. It may help him to prove that he wasn't there. Maybe that'll raise reasonable doubt in and of itself. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Sorry that got a little long, but I think it was worth explaining uh, in a little greater detail. Next, Suzanne Morphew, right? We talked about the autopsy that was returned yesterday or made public, I guess would be a more accurate statement uh, since it was done back in September of uh, 2023, uh, but just released uh, yesterday. But what we do know is uh, after Suzanne Morphew's body was found back in September of 2023, years after she uh, allegedly went on this Mother's Day bike ride back in 2020, um, and obviously never returned. Now, investigators have confirmed that she was the victim of a homicide and opioid and sedatives were found in her system. Now, when Suzanne Morphew did not return home, the uh, investigators in focused uh, primarily on her husband, Barry Morphew, as a murder suspect. But that case uh, got dismissed when it fell apart, when the prosecution failed to turn over exculpatory evidence to the defense. Now, remember, the prosecution always has a duty to turn over exculpatory evidence, and the judge described this prosecution's office's failure as egregious. What was it that they didn't do? Well, they failed to mention, even though they knew it months even before um, Barry Morphew was charged, that an unknown male's DNA, which turned up in a CODIS hit, that's the national database for bad guys, and that's maintained by the FBI, was linked to sexual assaults in Chicago, Illinois, as well as Phoenix and Tempe, Arizona. So does that mean that the man whose DNA was linked to multiple unsolved sexual assaults maybe has a pattern that involves 
drugging victims may be an opportunity where 404B evidence may come in. So was Suzanne Morphew, you know, originally drugged, assaulted, and then murdered by this unknown identified man through DNA? Was there a firearm involved because a bullet was apparently found near the body? And uh, where is this individual right now? Um, should we be worried, concerned? Is this, is this person in custody as of right now? But where was he back on Mother's Day of 2020? Interesting, interesting indeed. So as you all may also recall, Barry Morphew sued the prosecutors and investigators in this case because they knew five months before Morphew was arrested, but didn't disclose that this serial sexual assault suspect's DNA was found on various items of the crime scene. Like I said, the interior cushion of the bike helmet, Mrs. Morphew's bike, the glove box and back seat of Mrs. Morphew's Range Rover. Now, Barry Morphew alleges that the state kept that uh, hidden um, in his lawsuit and that it irreparably tarnished his name all across America by accusing him of murdering his wife over an affair and a failing marriage. Now, the Morphew family made a statement, as you may recall, uh, Suzanne and Barry Morphew's uh, daughter's stood behind Barry throughout and they continue to. Anyway, they made a statement uh, that says the autopsy confirms that Suzanne was abducted, allegedly drugged and buried 50 miles south of their home. The DNA left on the clothing by the murder could bring justice for Suzanne, her family and the community. The statement also said that it raises many questions about testing of a bullet in evidence. The authorities uh, will also not provide the Morphews any information regarding whether they have performed any testing on the bullet that was collected from Suzanne's remains. So Barry, Mallory, and Macy, the two daughters, uh, were given the option of retrieving Suzanne's remains, but they want to ensure the suspect is apprehended before they do that, because it could be an important part of the evidence. And obviously the defense may want to have their own independent expert evaluate those skeletal remains. So we will definitely be discussing the Suzanne Morphew case this evening. Join us live 6 p.m. Mountain Time for our live show. Next, Donald Trump held in contempt. That's right, the former president was found to be in contempt of the court's order and uh, violating the gag order in the uh, hush money case uh, trial that's going on in New York as we speak. And what is the fine for this contempt? A paltry $9,000. Now, Judge Merchan also warned the former president he could face jail if he does it again in a stern warning to start the uh, third week of the trial and uh, ripped some of his own arguments in the defense of his online attacks as absurd. In the warning, the judge noted that the uh, challenge of relying on financial penalties against a defendant who can easily afford to pay the fine is tough. And in this case, obviously, Donald Trump, a billionaire, uh, raised the possibility of whether in some instances jail may be the necessary penalty. Now, the uh, judge also uh, stated that uh, Mr. Trump was to remove the offending posts, which include calling potential witnesses Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels sleazeballs. Uh, the decision obviously uh, follows the uh, hearing that took place the other morning uh, where the lawyers contended that none of the posted statements violated the gag order and um, cited arguments around the First Amendment. The judge acknowledged that those sensibilities, saying that he was keenly aware of and protective of Mr. Trump's First Amendment rights, particularly given his candidacy for the United States uh, presidency. He said those rights must be curtailed and must be able to fully campaign for this office which he seeks and to be able to respond and defend against his political tax. But he called the gag order narrowly tailored to prevent such risks. Now you do know that Michael Cohen is literally going on live blasting um, every argument that the defense is making in this particular case, which is very odd, odd to me. Um, you know, wherever I've practiced, there's always been a sequestration order. And if a witness was in violation of hearing someone else's testimony, they were excluded from testifying. I think this is now the 
second case where I, I note it. Maybe it's an East Coast thing. I don't know. We saw this in the Alec Murdoch case where the witnesses got to sit in the courtroom, hear testimony, and then get up and testify. It was very bizarre to me. And now the Trump case where they get to watch the trial and then testify to that, unbelievable. I, I, I don't know why that is permitted. Anyway, um, now if uh, Donald Trump truly wanted to um, kind of give it to the judge, he could have said something to the effect of, well, judge, um, do you take cash or check? Uh, do I pay that here? or down in the clerk's office. But if I was Mr. Trump's attorney, which I am not, I would tell him, for the love of God, just keep your mouth shut. Like, don't you have surrogates that can do all this commentary that you do? Just just don't risk it. That's what I would tell the client. Is it really worth going to prison for, going to jail? Next, the Karen Reed trial continues. Now, we are streaming this trial, but it has already ended uh, for today, apparently I'm going to do a half day show or a half day trial. And uh, they're gonna end early on Thursday as well. So that's a little surprising as well, but we'll be discussing this case tonight on our show. And let's just say, yes, uh, it's like the paramedics that were called to the witness stand. Did they call central casting and say, we need somebody with a Boston accent here. And I love, don't get me wrong, I love Boston accents, I do. When you haven't been around Boston accents that often, it takes a little getting used to. You have to listen a little closer. Uh, but I love Boston accents, all right? So we're not throwing any shade on Boston accents. We love Boston accents, New York accents, Southern accents. Uh, you know, as you head west of the Mississippi, everybody just talks boring, I guess. We don't have really any accents out here, I guess. But I guess if you talk to the people in Boston, they would say that we have a, a weird accent. I don't know. We love Boston, though. All right. Finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. So police allege that Nolan Goins was involved in a road rage incident over someone basically flashing their headlights uh, the other evening as they were on a highway in Florida. Now, uh, per the victim statement in the alleged drive-by attack, it's alleged that the victim was hit in the arms, leg, and torso in a road rage. So what do you usually think is the... Uh, mode of uh, threat in a road rage incident. That's right. Firearms. Nope. Not today. Not with Mr. Goins. What did he throw? Food. Pasta specifically with sauce from the passenger seat of his vehicle, striking the victim um, who had his window down while he was driving. Now, Goins was found with the same food stains on his right sleeve and the male, <laughs> as the male target of the pasta uh, throwing incident. Now, Mr. Goins was charged with battery, a misdemeanor, and booked into the county jail. He was freed on a bond of $1,000. What can you say? What can you say? Mr. Goins has prior uh, convictions for selling marijuana, allegedly, and a uh, two battery charges, as well as numerous traffic infractions. We'll just leave it at that. But um, what can you say, man? I mean, Food pasta. Food crimes usually take place at the uh, house and at the restaurant. Now we've moved food crimes to the cars. So, Mr. Goins, you are our dumb criminal of the day. All right, everybody, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching. We shall see you this evening, 6 p.m. Mountain Time live. Uh, please join us, and we will go into our private Patreon show immediately following that. Please join us. And remember, the Constitution matters.